Hello, guys. Uh, I'm so happy to see all of you here enjoying our conference. I hope that you like the next uh, lecture too. Uh, Christo Mohamed, uh, who is uh, experienced system administrator, will talk to us. Well, so so. <laughs> So he will talk uh, to us about what he calls the new black in the world of operations, namely the unique kernels. Applaud him. <laughs> okay, so my name is Christo Mohamed. I work at CERN. I'm a systems administrator there, but I've also been known to write some JavaScript when I needed to. So I do whatever they give me to do there. Uh, today's talk is not about this, but about another thing that I'm super interested about these days. It's called Unique Kernels. And uh, I will start with a demo, because you know I have 40 minutes, so if I fail the demo thematically, and then I go a good talk, nobody will remember. So we'll just start with this. So I guess everyone here is familiar with Docker. Everyone, somebody doesn't use Docker? Except, okay, you. So what is basically Docker is, uh, it's basically some C group magic, little bit of SecComp. SecComp is secure computation. This is a, hmm, a mechanism other in the Linux kernel that you can whitelist and blacklist some uh, system calls. And that's basically Docker. And you know, this thing has kind of like taken the world of operations very badly. So now I'll start with my little demo by, you know, doing a little. So this just basically starts a HA proxy Docker container and it's extremely fast. It takes like 44, 0.44 seconds. If we do, uh, We can see that the HA proxy is there. And uh, that was quite fast. That's, uh, but Docker doesn't really provide you with the isolation. It's not a real operating system. It's basically a process contained with a little bit of C groups that is running on your machine, and that's it. What I want to talk about now is a radically new concept that can improve, that can give you the same things that Docker can give you, like memory density. And uh, it can give you actually real isolation. That's running an entire operating system in a hypervisor, or maybe even in a, as a process, as we'll talk a little bit about later, on top of a normal QMU, QMU hypervisor that has no user space and it only runs into kernel space. So I will stop my little Docker container. Which takes, come on, a long time. A long time. And what? Okay, sorry. So, in six seconds, a little bit more, we have started our entire operating system running only a single process, which is again HA proxy. We can also do the same thing. And we can see that HA proxy works. It is there. This is not a high, this is a very minimal operating system that loads up the entire HA proxy inside of kernel space. It has all the libraries it needs to operate. It's very cut out. It has basically no user space. It has no mechanisms to run anything in the user space. And whoops. No, no, sorry, it's Python. And it runs all of this in 58 megabytes. So that's an entire kernel with the HA proxy loaded inside in 58 megabytes that start in six seconds. And this is a very bloated unit kernel. You can cut it down to a bare minimum and lower this very uh, lower this by a lot. There are people starting unit kernels in the People like Claudius that uh, do OSV that start unikernels in less than a second when they start an entire honeypot running a unikernel. So, you know, just to start off by this. And now to actually explain what is a unikernel, we, uh, we can start with my slides. And my first slide talk what is really a unikernel. So that's basically, it's a single address machine image constructed using a library operating system. And we'll get back to this a bit later. But uh, first, I'd like to go back a bit about, in, about computing and why is this important and what actually made us walk the path to get to, to here when we talk about computers. So this thing is the TDC. 
So this is the tornado data, uh, this is the torpedo data computational device. This is one of the first computers to be used, I would say, in production. This was a machine that was installed in a submarine in the US Navy that was used to compute where you should shoot a tornado. Because this was extremely effective, even though it required two people in a submarine with it. So one guy had to maintain it and one guy had to operate it. And has anyone ever been in a submarine? Okay, you have been. I've also been in a submarine, so I was in a nuclear submarine in the US. I had a hard time walking through the hatch, and uh, the place where three people would sleep, I could barely fit there. So these guys had to be extremely small, and they had to install this huge thing inside of there, so they could stop calculating how to shoot torpedoes by hand. This is one of the first computers that was used, and it provided real value. By real value, uh, I don't mean academic value, I mean it had a specific purpose, it delivered a it delivered a specific goal, it was installed, it was deployed in production, and it was widely used. But if you think about this device, this device is extremely, it has very low velocity. Anyone here knows what is velocity in development, in deployment? Okay, so this term started when the Docker came into time, you know, it was all about starting a lot of VMs, doing all the configuration management on top, basically giving VMs to your developers super fast. Then the thing went into Docker, now velocity has increased to over 9,000 or whatever. But you know, if we measure velocity from 0 to 10, this guy had velocity of minus 10. Because first you had to develop all the hardware for it. You had to test it. I don't know how many people here have tried writing VHDL right now, but it's not extremely easy. It's not like writing JavaScript. And uh, they had to push the person to debug the hardware. They had to debug also the software running on this thing. And you needed two people to maintain it. So but in terms of velocity, this thing was very, very back. And now we have a lot of other things that came into existence, like Docker, like Linux containers, and so on, that kind of improve velocity little by little. If you go back into the history of computing, we have, uh, these are like all disruptive technologies that basically changed computing in a certain way. They were all started as academic projects that delivered a lot of real value to the business. And then business had to invest a lot of money into them to make them, to sponsor them so they could develop a lot. If you go back, virtualization was started in the 60s. That's how many years now? 57 years ago, 58 years ago. Like this is, I am 26, so this is like two times my lifespan and more. That virtualization was first taught in IBM. And uh, it was not really mature at the time for people to use it. I mean, this was still the time when computers were huge. They were kind of multi-user, maybe, maybe not. And uh, virtualization was not really a thing that was mature to be deployed widely by everyone there. Also in the 1960s, how many businesses used the internet? Probably zero or 10, 20. Maybe some universities had a computer. Was it really connected to another university somehow? Now, how many businesses do not use the internet? Minus all the small shops that sell alcohol and tobacco, like most, even those guys have a website now. And they have also presence online. So basically now everyone uses the internet. Then we have Mutix. So Mutix is an amazing operating system that came into 1969. Probably not a lot of people has heard of, have heard about it. It is what delivered the multi-user thing into the operating system world. It made it like super mainstream. So Mutix was a super successful operating system. It was not extremely used by all these old Unix hackers that everyone like romanticizes about, but it delivered the business value. It was financially extremely successful project. And the people who developed it made a lot of money using it. And then you have in the 70s when kind of computers became more and more mainstream, computing in universities became way more widespread. People started to use a lot of computers. And you know, they started to develop a lot of these small and operating systems. And this is when Unix was born. And this kind of increased the velocity. But even in the beginning when people were developing on Unix, those were still huge computers, extremely expensive, that not a lot of people had access to. And now we have computing becoming more and more available to people. And it's kind of natural that people adopted the multi-user approach to everything. I mean, in the past you had maybe a university with a few computers then that you had to use. Uh, if you read the Tenenbaum's book, there he always makes the jokes that, that you know, in faculty rank computer usage, you get the amount of computer usage from the big mainframe uh, or from whatever computer you had back then that did all the computation where the professor was getting the most. And then you have computing becoming more and more into the mainstream. We had Linux coming out in 1991. And this is kind of an extremely disruptive thing, Linux and Windows at the same time, because they kind of brought commodity computers for everyone. Now everyone can buy a computer, scrape it in a extremely easily, well not extremely easily, but everyone now had access to computers. And now you know, after this, kind of the internet 
came and exploded everywhere. And then a lot of virtualization projects came to life. We had Zen coming out in 2003, KVM coming in 2017. And these are all extremely important concepts. I mean, 2005 and 6 was the time when virtualization really took off. You could start reading about it in the New York Times. You could start reading about it everywhere. It became kind of the household name, so to say, around those times. And you know, then the operations world kind of got opened to virtualization. It was no longer just a huge academic exercise with people arguing should it be used or not. It allowed a lot of things to happen. I mean, imagine back in the days, if you read some of these old sysadmin books, they say, try to provision one machine for server, for per service. Now, can you imagine putting one machine running with the current day parameters running one Nginx. It's kind of hilarious, no? But at the time, this was the reality. I mean, back then, deploying a machine took a long time. You had to configure it. You had to install it manually. How many here work in a real data center? OK, so I also work in a real data center. And you know that sometimes installing a machine can take a long amount of time. Even if the machine is there, even if the cabling is there, but getting the authorization and installing it could take days. And this is days that the developer loses time. And we also had another thing that came with VMs. VMs could be made very easily. They could be installed very easily. Developers could destroy them very easily. But this was still kind of slow. Even my very minimal kernel took six seconds to start, while the Docker kernel took half a second to start. So you have now things like LXC that came in 2008. And I would argue that the 2008 computing was still not mature enough to adopt containers. Uh, in the mainstream, while some big corporations might have used something like containers back then, it was how many people in 2008 knew about Linux containers? How many people in 2010 knew about Linux containers? Okay, two people. And in 2012, okay, it's growing. 2015, okay, and now the entire room, except you, okay. <laughs> knows about containers. So back at the time, like how many companies had huge, huge services to deliver uh, in 2008? Well, you would say a few, but really the more modern boom happened now. And then you have Docker that kind of took containerization, which was still something that was a bit not extremely mainstream, and they made it mainstream. Now if you go, we have this extremely nice Docker command that can do everything for you. It can pull your logs, you can start images, you can download images. I mean, now you don't even need to learn to do configure most of the services. I mean, check out how to set up Kubernetes cluster. Download kubeadmin, run kubeadmin in it, done, it's done. How does it work? Well, nobody knows, but uh, as long as kubeadmin is maintained, everything is okay. And uh, this is all very nice, but is Docker really the thing to go off? Is containers really the thing to go off? With more and more security threats, maybe, maybe not. And uh, this is how a normal, well, we cannot really see anything in the contrast, but so everything except the docker runtime and the hyper, ah, you can actually see the borders, so I guess that's enough. So this is basically what a normal stack looks like now in the cloud. You have your configuration, your code, maybe a language runtime, most, mostly a language runtime if you develop for JavaScript or for uh, Python or for basically anything that, is, that needs the runtime. You have maybe a Docker runtime by Docker. I'm using Docker with containers because kind of Docker took off and it's like the most household name when it comes to containers. There is also other container technologies, but even my wife that does nothing related to computers knows about Docker. So let's, let's take it that for this presentation, Docker and containers will be interchangeably used. Uh, you have your shared libraries, you have your, uh, the kernel, and then you have a hypervisor, maybe, depending on the cloud provider you're using, if you're going to be hosting your own hypervisor or not. And then on top you have the hardware. But mostly running, you're getting this stack. And here you have a lot of redundant things. I mean, do we really need, some, uh, do we need all the libraries? Do we really use all the functions of the kernel? You'll be surprised how little functions of a kernel your Nginx or your Apache or your HA proxy or whatever application you're using is actually using. This is still code that is there and that is running. And uh, also this is how an application uses stuff. So you have all the libraries that it uses, maybe GTK or whatever. You have the libc and then you have the kernel. But a lot of the things are highly redundant if you think about it. I mean, how many functions from libc is a, a web server going to use? Not a lot, I presume. How many functions of the kernel is a web server going to use? And one of the mostly deployed things nowadays in the web are web servers. This is what is 
driving this technological boom, the demand for everything to be connected and to be processed and to be there on the internet and very easily accessible. So one could argue that with all of this, you don't really use most of the functions that are there. So we go back now to the beginning. What are unikernels? So these are like a extremely specialized. Think about the TDC again. The TDC was in its essence a uni device. It was like a unikernel. It had one thing it could do. It did it very well. And it could do nothing else. And if you think about it, a unikernel is the same thing. It's a specialized single address space image machine that does only one thing. It can only run HA proxy, or it can only run Nginx, it can only run, I don't know, pff, there was, I gave this talk in another presentation, there was a guy running Postgre in a unikernel there. So maybe it will run only Postgre and nothing else. It will be unaccessible and it will be unable to know about anything else. And uh, it would kind of look like this. You cannot really see a lot, but that's okay. So it will take only parts of your libraries. It will take only part of the uh, lib1, only part of the lib2. Maybe it will take part of libc. Maybe you need DNS, so it will take the resolver part. Maybe it needs part of the kernel, whatever part of your kernel. It would take this. You need certain system calls. You could take those, but it would not really know or do anything else that it doesn't know or need. So in a sense, it's uh, extremely tightly packed an uh, extremely small kernel. As we saw, we run an entire HA proxy inside of 59 megabytes. HA proxy, I checked before that, if you just run it, just listening for the statistics, it's around 17 megabytes. So we took a bloated unit kernel that was 37 megabytes. Now, I don't know how much is a normal kernel in memory when you load it, but I would take it quite a bit more. Uh, so basically, but unit kernels have you kind of want to do this. I mean, with Docker, you're taking replication, you are taking your libraries, you're running it through some kind of a interface, and you take a unique kernel. This is what we will take for this technology to go forward. And there's like a lot of steps being taken, mostly now as an uh, academic exercise, but a lot, a lot more people are actually using this and earning money doing that. So you take some kind of a mystery machine to compile unique kernel. The demo I showed you, which is the Rumprun, this is one of the unique kernels that, are being, uh, that uh, I've been interested in. You need to do very minor modifications in the HA proxy code to get it to run inside. And mostly because in the unique kernel you have no such thing as uh, processes, you just want everything to be threads. So your back then, your uh, huge stack that looks like this, would now just go back to looking like this, which is a lot less. It gives a lot of less attack surface, and uh, it's a lot smaller, a lot in times smaller. So you now everything that you will be doing your normal application, you'll be developing it on your normal computer, you'll be debugging it in your production, in your uh, test environment, and then you're going to deploy it in a, u you're going to pack it in a unique kernel, and then deploy it in a unique kernel. Then it's going to run maybe on a hypervisor, maybe not, and then you're going to run this on your hardware. So there are, uh, so what do we really gain by doing this? Because everything I'm saying is kind of a cool story until we actually see the real benefits that the Unikernel has. So uh, it's based on the library OS. So that means it only needs certain components. So this is a bit of a, this, so this could be like a knife with two edges because do you need a TCP stack? Okay, you could reuse an existing TCP stack and cut it down or you could develop your own TCP stack. Do you need IO? Okay, you need I.O., you need uh, so everything you need to re-implement yourself, you need to exist, use an existing I.O. So I don't know, how many people here have written their own TCP stack? One person, wow, amazing. <laughs> at uh, Site Reliability Con this year, nobody had done that, so I'm super amazed. Well, it's not easy, as you know. It takes a lot of debugging. The current TCP stack in the Linux kernel took a lot of effort to be written, and it's still lagging behind the FreeBSD one. Uh, but still, everything is a component that you can plug in and plug out. This gives a very interesting benefit, actually. Because, okay, now we want to edit something in the, let's say, the TCP stack. That's something extremely arcane, arcane and only you would use. What do you do with that change? Any suggestions? Do we give it to Linus to merge in the mainline kernel? Probably he'll say no. What do we do? Do we piggyback our change through every new kernel we want to use? That takes a lot of effort as well. Uh, so probably with the unikernel, you can have your little, very arcane change applied to your TCP stack. 
And as long as the TCP stack does what it wanted to do and it fits your needs, you can just continue to ship it off forward and forward while you're updating your application code. And uh, well, you can now be a kernel developer very easily without complying with anyone else that is out there. It is a single process in a single address space, so you don't have, uh, well, you don't have any of the other, uh, you don't have any of the losses uh, operating in a, in a virtual address space. There is no virtual memory, there is no context switching, no different modes of execution. This basically means you're never going to be begging the kernel for anything. Your application is never going to be begging the kernel for anything. Your application is never going to do any context switching, which can add a lot. And uh, well, we have no virtual memory, so we get some performance benefits from there. One of the most important parts, at least for me, is the less code. This means the less attack surface. And I actually added the later part, a bit the other part for this presentation. But let's go for the less attack surface. So in 2016, there was a very interesting presentation at the BSDCom, uh, where so one guy took his summer in 2016, and he was basically uh, doing security audits on all of the BSD kernels. And he found a lot, a lot of vulnerability in all of the BSD kernels. Can you guess where he found most of the vulnerabilities? Where? No, in the system calls, because there are like multiple system calls. Do you know which uh, BSD had the most system calls out there and still has? No, NetBSD. NetBSD, which can run on any device. You can install it probably on your mobile phone and it would still somehow run. This guy had so many vulnerabilities because it was supporting so much old code. It was still using things f like uh, stuff for the telephones from 2000, from the early 2000s. Stuff that like completely nobody ever uses out there. Can you guess which BSD was on second place in the amount of vulnerabilities found? FreeBSD, yes. Because it also has a huge amount of system calls in there. And mostly the guy was fuzzing the kernels and looking around, he found plenty of vulnerabilities in the system calls. OpenBSD was not far behind FreeBSD. He was maybe just two times, but the OpenBSD kernel in size, it's much, much smaller. I mean, these guys completely rem removed a lot of things. They don't even have a Bluetooth stack right now, but they still had multiple problems in their kernel. And running, how many system calls are there in Linux right now? 350 plus, last time I checked, that's a huge amount. I mean, the Linux kernel source code right now is more than 4 million lines. With a unique kernel, you are losing all of this cruft. You don't need these 4 million calls because you probably your computer does not need to support some CPU from the 90s, most likely. It does not need majority of the cruft that is right there in the Linux kernel, which is there because the Linux kernel needs to run everywhere or as many devices as possible, and it needs to be multi-user. You are losing the ability to run in a multi-user environment. You're losing all of this. So in a, in a unique kernel, there is no logging. There are no users. There is no etc passw file. There is no etc shadow file. There is absolutely no mechanisms to authenticate inside of the unique kernel. It just runs the application code inside the kernel space. So you lose all of this cruft, which you can gain a huge security benefit just removing all of this code. Because you know, the code that has the least amount of bugs is the code that doesn't exist. I mean, the code that was the most security audited was uh, one with like uh, 2,000 stars on GitHub that is completely blank. <laughs> it just has an int main and compiles on every operating system. Another thing, why unikernels, in my opinion, are more secure than Docker. So seccomp, as I mentioned earlier, so this is, the, again, the secure computation. This basically means that you can enter a mode of execution where you a secure mode of execution when you whitelist certain system calls for your process. So this basically means that you can tell the kernel, OK, I only need this subset of system calls, and I only need for to execute. So you can blacklist the others for me. So if your process is somehow compromised, you know, another person cannot exploit them. Docker has 250 system calls whitelisted when you start its stock. That's huge. That's like probably most of the arcane system calls from Linux concerning something that nobody knows what it does are not included in this. So basically, you don't get any of the seccomp benefits running Docker, absolutely any of them. You get better memory density because as you saw, unikernels are extremely small. Yes, they are bigger than a Docker container, but yeah, you, can, you can start cutting down more and more code and uh, get them to a reliable size. You can run them on a bare hardware. You don't need a hypervisor if this is your thing. You can run them on top of existing hypervisor. So majority of the Unix kernels implementation now uh, support most of the hypervisor. Zen, QMU, KVM, 
Uh, I don't know about Hyper-V, probably not. Uh, they are completely mutable. So a Docker container is not a completely mutable structure. Even if you mount everything read-only, you can still do stuff inside of the memory of a Docker container, which you can also do inside of the Unikernel, but there you're not going to mount any file system, and you cannot really exploit any vulnerability related to that file system. So all your configurations are also going to be packed inside of the Unikernel. It has a very small footprint, and as we saw, a very low boot time. I mean, majority of the operating systems right now, even if you cut them down, probably for some embedded devices, they will boot a bit faster. Uh, Unikernels can also be used inside of an embedded device because of the small memory footprint. And uh, one important thing, it has none of the time sharing characteristics. So this is also another security vector that is completely removed when you're using a Unikernel. Right, uh, right now, in uh, Unikernels, there are basically two camps running there. So you have the old, post-old, the POSIX compliant Unikernels, and you have the language-specific Unikernels. So you have the RUMPRUM, which is uh, actually a very contributed to project. There are plenty of examples of uh, Unik things ported to Unikernels. I showed you the HA proxy port. There is for Nginx, there is for Cassandra, there is for a myriad of applications. In the RUMP run, you can even run Java applications. You can run the JVM on the RUMP Unikernel. There is the OSV uh, Unikernel. So that's uh, not just the runtime. It also provides uh, OS compatibility. Uh, of course, there are a bit of a tricks with these unikernels. As I said, there are, so this, this is one single process that runs in the unikernel, so there is no processes. So when you're trying to port something for OSV, for example, until you discover that fork always returns true. This could be a bit of a, you know, a bit of a hiccup here and there. There is also the language-specific unikernels. So I personally do not program in any of these languages, except I had to somehow struggle with C++. But you can use this with a language-specific one. You have Mirage OS, which is for OCaml. It's actually a very also developed unique kernel. They were recently bought by the Docker systems. You have Include OS, which uh, is for C++, and it's very easy to use also. You have the Haskell one. The JavaScript one died, sadly. Nobody maintains it, but you know, if somebody has a desire, he can also contribute there. I already did my little demo. And uh, now, most, one of the most important things that you know, I, I, I've been asked when I've been talking about people about unikernels is what can you run there? Well, you can run anything there. Uh, but uh, these are the things that are mostly of interest when we're talking about unikernels. So that's stateless services. So your, your web servers that you now run in Docker and most of those stuff can be very easily ported to unikernels. And you can reap all the benefits of running inside of a unikernel. There is actually a very interesting project called Unique. So basically, these are some of the these are some people from uh, the ex Dev EMC. No, these are some people from EMC uh, that uh, wanted to make uh, kind of unified interface between Docker and uh, the Rumpran or OSV. So this basically means taking all of your existing Docker infrastructure and just using and then just putting the Unikernels inside of there instead of your container images. So you can then leverage all your schedulers and everything that you already now use with containers. You can leverage that with unikernels. Suddenly, this project is no longer actively maintained. The last commit is six months ago. But you can still use it for that. Uh, you have still all the apparatus around managing virtual machines, which is an extremely mature and extremely big ecosystem that containers are still struggling to get to that level. You can use it for honeypots. The people behind the How VM are actually doing this, and uh, they've shown multiple examples of spawning thousands of honeypots in a network. For example, you can see that you're getting scanned, and then like your IP range is getting scanned. So instead of blocking the attacker, you can maybe spawn 10,000 unikernels somewhere there, and you know start masquerading uh, about stuff, uh, start masquerading as other operating systems. They've also done this as a security demo when uh, they do the same inside of a private network. It can be used for Tor nodes, because when somebody comes to your door asking about Tor, you can say, okay, here is it. And once it's destroyed, everything is gone. So no logging or anything about it. It can be used for network devices. This is another very interesting use. Any small network device, for example, for software-defined networks, 
uh, or things that are routers that need to do very quick decisions here and there can be used in a unikernel because of the small boot time. You can get a unikernel there in a, say, in a matter of seconds. It can do the decision and it can disappear, leaving no footprint and taking no memory and then resources. And it can basically be used for anything highly specialized. As I said, there are people that have ported Kafka, Cassandra, and multiple other applications to a unikernel. And uh, well, there is always a catch with everything. And that is that unikernels are hard. As I said earlier, if you want to develop your own library component for, uh, if you want to develop your own library, like a TCP stack or like something that relates to I.O., this takes a lot of development. And probably if you want to take something highly customized for yourself, this is probably not for everyone. Certainly it's not for a company that runs with uh, 10 people personal and uh, they're all struggling to do everything. So probably for most startups, doing something in a unikernel will be a bit hard. Uh, but for big companies that actually spend a lot of money and try to increase memory density, unikernels can save money in the long run. There is also the matter about debugging, because debugging is hard. Debugging a kernel is in itself already hard with all the apparatus that we have. And this is basically a kernel that you have to debug. So you have all the normal tools like GDB that you can attach to running unique kernel, but that's still not uh, extremely accessible to the average developer. Debugging a Docker container, it's relatively easy, even for a person who doesn't do anything about operations. Debugging a unique kernel, even for a systems uh, engineer, could be quite the challenge. Also, there is the thing about uh, tracing and profiling. So there is this guy, Florian, Dr. Florian Schmidt. He did a lot of work on uh, Uniprof. So Uniprof is basically a unikernel profiler that uh, basically took Zentec, Zen CTX, which was too slow for him. And then he re tried to iterate over it to make it faster. So Zen CTX is a profiling tool for Zen. So he took the Zen CTX and he iterated over it until he got to Uniprof. So Uniprof is actually very fast. It does very little impact on the operation of the unikernel. And you can do, well, we can do the Zen Profilic and Zen CTX. It's actually a lot of work. And it just shows that if one person decides and he wants to move forward the technology, he can contribute a lot about it. Because yes, unikernels are a new technology. They don't have all the tooling. But think about in the past, in 2003, was Kubernetes here for the general public? Probably no. And now Kubernetes is everywhere. Was Docker Swarm there in 2003? No. And now it's 2018. So for five years, we've moved from an ecosystem that had very little tools to, uh, I wouldn't say a mature ecosystem, but we moved to an ecosystem that allows people to run a lot of uh, their application and code in production. Uh, we also have the log forwarding uh, that has to go somewhere. And here we have the syslog protocol that is perfectly ideal. Nowadays, a lot of people are trying to reinvent logging. And I'm still a huge fan of the syslog protocol because it's basically a correctly formatted string and nothing else. You don't need most of these fancy things that the people are using nowadays when it comes about logging. So with the uh, with majority of these tools, you can do the same profiling and the same debugging as you can on a normal on a normal process and on a normal kernel. Now the amount of uh, proficiency it would take it's a bit higher than debugging a normal container. And uh, I guess that's okay to a certain point. But of course, if this technology wants to become mainstream, people have to contribute to it. And uh, by this, I mean maybe the business has to adopt it and pour more money inside of it. Uh, there is another thing that I want to talk about. This is a huge slide, so I'll try to go fast over it because I'm also running out of time. So this is uh, a really kernel really that hard because we have all the tooling that we have to profile and to debug processes right now. And uh, recently there was this uh, paper that I've linked down below by these people. Uh, who were uh, trying to do unikernels as processes. And uh, what this means was they're trying to simulate running a unikernel as a process. So then you can use, this was kind of tautology, yes. So then you can use all the um, profiling tools that you have on, on them. So basically, how does a normal unikernel now run? So you have a monitor. So this is the QMO or uh, the KVM that does all the setup of the, it's doing all the setuping of the unikernel or of the even of a VM also. It works the same way for VMs. So that is going, it's going to allocate memory, all the virtual CPU structures, open file descriptors, and so on. And then it's going to do the exit handling. Then uh, your unikernel is only going to exit to, or your VM for that matter, 
is only going to, is going to exit to the uh, monitor for doing I/O and for do with a hyper call or do other various type of hyper calls. Does people know what is a hyper call? So basically, a hyper call is what is uh, hyper call is like a system call to your um, to your hypervisor, and then the hypervisor implements how he's going to ask the kernel about stuff. And then the, your resolution in the normal case when you're running a VM or a unikernel on top of a hypervisor comes from the fact that the monitor is a process. So you have all the isolation coming from that inside of your kernel. So in this paper that uh, I put a link also in the presentation, you can, um, they're exploring a new way to run uh, the unikernel as a process in the kernel itself. So then you're going to, so basically, sorry, to go back to the first part, if something manages to somehow exit to your kernel module and exploit that in the normal way that you're running uh, a virtualization, then you can exploit the entire machine. In the second way, we're going to have something that they're calling a tender, which is basically, again, like a QM or a KVM, UKVM uh, monitor, which is going to do exactly the same things. But instead of uh, waiting for the unikernel uh, and uh, handle the hypercodes, it's actually going to load the code of the unikernel into another space. So the unikernel is becoming basically another dynamically loaded library. It's going to inherit all the registry states from that tender. And uh, it's going to configure, before it loads the unikernel code, all the sec computers for that unikernel. Why is this extremely important? Because now, you have very limited amount of system calls that you exist already know which are. So look, in UKVM, you have just 10 hyper calls. In Zen, you have 20 hyper calls that translate to equal amount of system calls. So now you can actually apply SecComp, and SecComp can actually be useful in this way to your uh, to, the, to, uh, to the tender in the unikernel. It's not just going to be something that is added and it blacklists the 100 most arcane system calls in Linux kernel, like Docker does. It's actually going to be something that works and provides the security it was meant to. Then all the, when the unikernel needs to do a procedure call, it's going to talk to the tender, and then your isolation actually comes from SecComp. You still have the same isolation as a normal process, but you have also filtered the amount of, of, amount of syscalls uh, that the tender is doing a lot. So you basically get SecComp to actually work and be useful. And this is my presentation. <laughs> Please don't ask me very complex questions because I don't want to destroy my career. So, uh, I'll do it again. So let's start with a simple question. So uh, you didn't mention performance improvements, but basically you're not doing any context switches anymore, right? So it should be quite a bit faster as well. So people saw, uh, so in, if you check this paper, so there people were actually benchmarking uh, applications, both as processes, uh, running in a container and then running in a unikernel. So for some Python uh, stuff, they found 250 perfor throughput, performance throughput improvement on the network part. Uh, they saw 98% less accessing to the kernel functions when they're profiling them. They saw a lot less uh, everything basically being used. So they saw quite a big uh, uh, improvements. You can check also majority of the stuff done by the HowVM unikernel. But again, I, I don't want to talk about performance because each unikernel is unique. So if you really want to see the performance, you should check it out there. Because if you're writing in Haskell and you go to the HowVM unikernel, you see performance improvements in the way they've implemented it. If you write in Okamo, you can go to Mirage OS. Uh, writing stuff for uh, OSV or for uh, Rumprun, you're going to get different, uh, different part of the library is written in a different way and different architectural decisions taken in a different way. So basically you need to decide for yourself and benchmark. This is, the, this is the easiest way. I cannot tell you right now, use this unikernel and you're going to certainly get 35% increase. Or you're going to save, uh, I don't know, 100 gigabytes of memory on WS. I don't know that, so. Thanks. Somebody else? Oh, okay. oh, this looks like a hard question. <laughs> No worries. Um, so, what do you think it will take? First, an obser observation: um, every Linux machine, this one including, uh, has KVM in the kernel, right? So, so it's not a matter of compatibility. So, what do you think it will take for major uh, applications like MySQL, PostgreSQL, Nginx, etc., um, to provide packages uh, in this format? 
uh, as part of the standard project. Uh, no, not something that... Uh, yeah, this is actually a very easy question to ask. What did it took for them to do the same with Docker? It needs the same amount of business traction to happen for unikernels, and they need to become a bit more mainstream. So this paper is actually, in my opinion, extremely important because it shows that unikernels can actually enter the mainstream very easily. Because if you think about it, a Docker uh, container is nothing but a process running there. If you can run the same process but actually get the security benefit and actually use the same tooling, maybe it would take a little bit more uh, attention from the business side. Because as we know, engineers are extremely expensive. So if you can save on manpower due to the less amount of security team you need, that's already a huge benefit. So okay, thank you. It would take the same it took any other huge disruptive technology. So we had a slide with uh, several technologies. I'm not sure if I should call them libraries or frameworks like include OS. This so one. are these based on a Linux kernel or they just let you write ring zero? So none of this is, so on this one, these are like purest, purest unique kernels. So everything there is basically written from scratch. So all these libraries, are, they have nothing to do with Linux. I mean, if you do something in C++ using include OS, you're not running Linux anymore. Uh, the thing in OZV and Rumrun, there are parts which are taken. So Rumrun is basically based on NetBSD, so you will be taking parts from there. And uh, OZV, I think it's uh, also not, I'm not sure if what they're based on. I've never actually tried OZV, but uh, I tried compiling it and felt miserably. But <laughs> it's uh, actually from all the project, this is one that gets, uh, so uh, this is maintained by Claudius and they get a lot of commits, but I think they also are, I don't think they're also based on Linux. I think they took another uh, kernel of their base. Um, are you using some unicorns anywhere or do you plan on using them uh, and for well, what? So we, I, we are, I'm, I work in academia, so I know things there move a bit slow, but uh, we are planning to move most of our web services to unikernels. Because, uh, well, most of our web services are kind of fit. They're mostly stateless, so they're fit for that. I'm basically the driving force wanting to do that. So I am the hipster at work. <laughs> <laughs> but as uh, I said again, there are multiple people who uh, use this in production already. Probably not for web services, but there, are, there was actually a very interesting uh, Bitcoin pin, uh, pinata based on the Okamo unikernel that had uh, one Bitcoin inside. And I think it took more than a year before somebody could hack it and claim it which is quite an achievement, I would say. Um, is anyone working on a unikernel, I guess, with like a file system? Because so, you would need that to start experimenting with putting databases you, in these, right? Uh, you, you can uh, use a file system in Rompront, for example. Oh, really? We'll just yes. use the Linux file system? Or? Uh, it's using, uh, well, I, uh, I guess you can use, uh, I guess they have some kind of a library to use the Linux file system. I've never actually used a file system in a unikernel. I'm guilty of that. So I cannot really answer your question, but I can Google it and tell you in the break. Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you. One final question, uh, maybe. Oh, uh, you're, you're the most dangerous. Oh. Like, the only person to write the TCP <laughs> stack, so. No, uh, I, I think it's a simple one. Uh, do you know about any unikernels uh, for other architectures rather than x86? No. You're, you're, you're not aware or you know that? I am, I'm not aware. Okay. I think you can, uh, I, I'm not sure, maybe I'm lying to you, but I think you can use room front on the arm, but again, maybe I'm lying to you, completely lying to you, so. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, so uh, let us applaud again our speaker. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. His presentation was uh, interesting even uh, for a person who has never written with uh, Docker, so <laughs> thank you.